Cool. Okay, so yeah, let's discuss things that uh, for the today's the topic. So uh, last time we are basically discussing some kind of the very basic uh, the OpenGL uh, the based uh, the rendering the pipeline, which is basically utilizing the uh, the rasterization the idea, and also we discussed some kind of the some ideas in terms of how we can you know expect some kind of three D transformations using the especially the three D rotations uh, using the quaternions. So those are basically some kind of images that we can easily render using some kind of the OpenGL based code. Uh, you can say that it looks kind of okay with some kind of the simple the shape and also kind of the texture and the color information. Uh, we can basically render some kind of the uh, some three D object into the two images. And these are typically something that you can also basically uh, get as kind of your the outputs uh, of the assignments of the introduction of the course. In the CS380 course, uh, the basically all the assignments are basically implementing something using the OpenGL and basically getting this kind of the outputs, uh, which is actually involving quite much some kind of the programming. Uh, you should be able to basically uh, program all the things in the, the vertex shader and the flatness shader, many kind of the complicated things. Uh, you also should be able to basically manipulate all these objects in terms of the transformations, uh, which means that you should have some understanding for the quaternion, many things. Uh, but you might be kind of disappointed that actually the output uh, of the, all the kind of complicated uh, the, the programming, it turns out that we are getting this kind of the quality of the outputs. Actually, we, what, what we are basically expecting as kind of the output of the rendering uh, is this quality of the images. Right? So this is not a real photo, but some kind of the output of the rendering, uh, where you can see some kind of the very realistic, uh, photorealistic details uh, in terms of like having some very uh, details of the old geometry, but also having the lighting and the sh you know, shading and the shadows and basically having all this kind of the, uh, some high detail, some kind of quality uh, is in terms of like all the uh, part of the images. So the focus of like this course is basically how we can uh, achieve this kind of the rendering the outputs uh, by switching the rendering the pipeline. So that's basically what we are going to uh, discuss uh, in this course. So what we have discussed in the previous time is basically the rasterization the pipeline. While what we are going to uh, discuss today is more about the ray casting and also the ray tracing. So the difference between the rasterization and the ray tracing is actually nothing but it's more about like, whether we're gonna basically project all the things in the 3D into the 2D plane first and do some kind of the process in the, the 2D plane. Or we're gonna basically not just like projecting things into the 2D plane first, but actually shooting the ray uh, from the camera uh, through the 2D plane into the 3D space. Uh, in terms of that, basically not just like protecting things, but kind of like fetching some kind of the color or some kind of the material information uh, from the, the, the region where we are basically seeing some kind of the intersection between the ray and the 3D objects. So that's kind of the major difference between the rasterization and also the ray testing and the ray tracing. So if you see a little bit more details about each of the algorithm, uh, the rasterization, the pipeline uh, typically has this kind of form. So what we, as we discussed in the previous lecture, what we are basically having is that you know, we first basically initialize the Z buffer, uh, which is the having the same size with the, the rendered image. And for each of the old triangle, uh, we are projecting those triangle into the 2D plane. And we start to care about each of the pixel uh, inside the triangle, which is also so called the fragment, right? So for each of the fragment, uh, we are basically interpolating uh, all the information that are basically defined for each of the purposes of the triangles. So in interpolating uh, the information defined at the, the purposes of the triangle in the 2D plane, uh, define some kind of the color information and also the depth information. And if the depth information that we are calculating is basically a closer, then the depth that was uh, stored in the G buffer, then we are basically updating the information in the image. So this was the very typical the idea, the pipeline data retroalition. It is clear. So this was basically something that we discussed last time. So we first you know, project all the 3D triangles uh, into the 2D plane. And for each of the triangle, we start to see what are the pixels that are included uh, for each of the projected the triangle. And in the 2D plane, we are interpolating the information that are defined over the vertices that will basically determine the color and the depth many things uh, for each of the pixel. And basically we are getting the depth information uh, from the interpolation of the, 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 the triangles. And if this depth information is basically closer than the depth that we are having in the depth buffer, then we are replacing the information 
uh, the color and the depth information for each pixel. So we keep iterating this kind of process uh, for every single bit triangle uh, for the also to update the all the pixel information. So this is the very typical the framework for the rasterization. And what we can see is that actually the ray tracing and also the ray testing is kind of the opposite. So we start to care about the, all the pixels, not all the bit triangles. So for every single pixel, what we do is that we, we are now shifting a ray uh, from the camera to center, uh, you know, making the ray which is the passing through of the pixel, and see you know which you know where this ray is basically intersecting uh, with some kind of three D objects. So if we see some kind of the intersection between the ray and some three D object, that we can now some kind of retrieve some kind of the color or the many other information uh, from that you know, the point we are seeing the intersections. So in that way, we can basically update each of the pixel. So this is kind of a uh, different way that we are basically updating each of the pixel information, which sounds kind of very similar with the rest uh, but we're gonna see what's kind of the advantage like this kind of approach. Uh, it is clear the difference between the rest addition and the ray tracing. So in the rest addition, it's basically you know, object first, uh, for each of the objects, we are projecting them and then see what are the pixels that are included for each of the triangle and basically updating all the pixel information. And the ray tracing is basically the pixel first. So for each of the pixel, we should be ray and see at which point over the 3D object, we are making some kind of intersection uh, between the ray and the objects and then fetching the color or the many other information uh, from the point of the 3D objects to update the pixel information. So that's kind of the major difference between the rasterization and the ray testing. And uh, actually, this ray testing is basically a very old idea, which was first introduced in the 1968, uh, which is uh, 56 years ago. So it's quite a very old idea. Uh, so it's just basically uh, the idea that we are kind of like simulating uh, the, the lighting kind of this optical the, the process. So basically, the ideal case that we are really simulating the optical process might be is actually starting from not from the camera, but actually starting from the light source. So as you can see, if we really wanted to have some very precise simulation of the optics, what we can do is that uh, we are really simulating all the kind of light traversal. So starting from the light source, uh, we are shooting all the rays of the light and see where basically these rays are basically intersecting with the 3D objects. And also, you know, basically tracing all the kind of the rays in terms of like, you know, uh, which, uh, what are basically the rays, uh, which are basically reaching to the image plane. So in a way that we are really basically simulating all these kind of the travels of the rays uh, that are basically uh, reaching to the image plane and then basically calculating all the color information. But the problem like this kind of the process is that uh, there might be a uh, very uh, small amount of the rays, uh, which are really you know, uh, arriving to the image plane. So there might be very low kind of the heat rate uh, in terms of like when you see like how many of the rays are really basically you know, uh, coming back to the, basically the image plane, there might be very few number of the rays, which means that the computation will be very inefficient. So in terms of like you know, handling this kind of like inefficiency, actually we go in the other way around. So we are not starting from the light source, but actually we are starting from the image plane, which means that we are basically back tracing uh, all the rays uh, from the image plane to the light source. So what we can basically do is that uh, instead of like shooting the uh, ray from the, the light source, now we are shooting the ray from the, uh, the eye point, from the, the camera the center. Uh, for, each of the, the, uh, for each of the pixel, we are basically shooting the ray and check the intersection point uh, with any of the 3D objects. So as you can see here, uh, we are shooting the, uh, sorry, yeah, ray here. And we see some basically intersection point here. And the way that we can basically update the pixel information might be is that uh, we can somehow re retrieve some kind of the color or some many other information uh, from this point, uh, which will basically update uh, this pixel information, right? But here, basically, what we also want to do is that we also want to determine the color information not only based on some kind of the some you know uh, inherent kind of property uh, of this surface, but also based on the light here. So what we actually do is that we are not only basically you know checking this point, uh, but we actually shoot a ray again uh, to the light source to check whether this point not only visible from the eye point 
but also from the light source. Uh, which means that if there are some kind of the occlusion, uh, which is basically you know, occluding uh, this point from the light source, then this point will not basically receive some kind of the rays from the light source, right? Which means that this point will be dark. So we should not basically bring some kind of color information from this point. So basically what we are going to actually discuss uh, in the rest of this course is that basically how we can model this kind of the reflection kind of things. Uh, in terms of like you know, when he uh, the calculated color information at this point, uh, we are not only basically caring about the, some kind of the surface property at this point, uh, but also some kind of the light information from here, and also checking whether this point is also visible from the uh, light source as well. In terms of that, we can calculate uh, the color information based on this surface property and also the light source property, and then updating this you know, pixel information. So for some more the details about this, the reflection of the system in terms of how we're going to really calculate uh, the color at this point uh, using both the surface property and the, uh, the light source the property, uh, we're going to also discuss all these kind of things uh, in the rest of the course. But this is basically the basic idea for the ray casting, uh, which is basically caring about the light source uh, in terms of like, you know, updating the, uh, the color information. Uh, it is clear. Any questions on this? So this is basically the basic idea for the ray casting. But the thing is that if we really wanted to have some you know, precise uh, the simulation for the optic system, uh, you, you know, the light reflected at this point uh, will not just like come from the directly from the light source, but there can be some many other kind of the passes uh, that is like coming the light you know, from the light sources uh, to this point, right? So there can be many other ways around basically somehow, I don't know. Uh, make some kind of deflections with some other different objects, and also the uh, the light you know, arrives at this point. So to basically handle all these kind of the cases, actually we need to be we should be able to be basically iteratively update uh, this kind of the uh, the ray information. So what we typically do is that uh, we are not only basically caring about the first the hit point. So let's say when you shoot the ray from the the camera center uh, to this 3D space. And this might be the first point uh, that we are seeing some kind of the intersection. Then also what we can do is that uh, we are also uh, you know, checking you know, where the ray basically should be reflected uh, using some kind of the reflection model as well. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, you know, basically you know, when it is some kind of a spectral re reflection, uh, then we can calculate uh, where the ray should be reflected to like this. Right? Then we are also having the another the intersection into the three D objects, and we can repeat this process, right? So until we have some kind of some uh, spectral reflections over the three D surfaces, uh, we can iterate uh, having this kind of the second ray, uh, basically having another the intersection with the three D objects, uh, in terms of like the tracing uh, all the paths of the three D objects uh, into the three D space like this. So as you can see, this is the case that we are having some reflection. So the ray is basically reflected over the surface. And this is another case that we are basically seeing some kind of the reflection, uh, which is the case that even the ray is like passing through the objects, uh, which is basically not making another branch of the rays. So we keep iterating all this kind of like the, the, the process, basically shooting the second ray uh, in terms of that, you know, we are really reaching to the uh, either the light source where we are basically reaching to the some kind of the maximum the iterations. And then now we can calculate uh, the color of each of the, the pixel here by accumulating the color information that we are calculating uh, all the intersection the point. And, and, and also when you basically determine the color information for the all the intersection the point, uh, we also shoot the ray uh, to the light source to check uh, whether this point is really basically uh, visible from the light source or not, whether we have some kind of the occlusions here or not. So based on whether this point is basically occluded or not, we can also determine the color information at this point uh, by combining the material information at this surface and also the light information, which is basically seeing this point. So this kind of the iterative process, like basically you know, you know, really you know, traversing, uh, tracing all these kind of paths of the rays are basically called the ray tracing. So the difference with the ray casting is that ray casting is the case that we only care about the uh, the first intersection point. 
And at least in the first intersection point, we determine the color information uh, by shooting the ray to the light source, uh, which is called the shadow ray. And the ray tracing is not only caring about the first intersection point, but we also really trace uh, this kind of traverse of the rays uh, by shooting the second ray, uh, which is basically determined based on the reflection of the model. So at this point, uh, we shoot the another the second ray, uh, which is uh, the direction is determined by the some the reflection kind of the model, and also the another ray based on the reflection as well. So we keep iterating all this process in terms of like having this kind of the trajectory, uh, all the rays. And for every intersection the point, we also shoot the, the shadow ray uh, to the light source uh, to determine the all the color information. And the final, the pixel, the color information is basically determined based on some kind of the uh, linear combinations of those colors. So this is kind of the ray tracing system. Any questions on this? So as you can see, especially when you see this kind of like ray tracing the system, uh, the major difference with the rasterization is that uh, for the rasterization, uh, we cannot really you know, deal with this kind of the, uh, you know, some kind of the light in, you know, in interactions with the surface. So since we are basically shooting the real the ray into the 3D space, and also since we can you know, trace all the rays uh, into this kind of the second rays in the, the, the path, uh, now we can really calculate uh, this kind of some, we can do some kind of more precise some sort of the, the optic simulation uh, in terms of precisely determining all the color information and also finally basically uh, calculating color information for each of the pixel. But in the rasterization, since everything is basically just like projected into the 2D plane, uh, we cannot really have this kind of the calculation, which is really uh, caring about this kind of the ray and the object, the intersection, and also updating the color information based on the light source. So, which means that uh, the ray tracing can be kind of the, uh, sorry, the rasterization can be some kind of the faster system, uh, which is also typically basically accelerated uh, by some kind of the hardware implementation. Uh, but this cannot be some kind of the accurate, some kind of the rendering the system uh, in terms of that we cannot track uh, all the lines uh, in this radio space. And compared to the rasterization, the advantage of the ray tracing is that uh, this is becoming uh, more accurate, some kind of simulation of the light the traversal. But obviously, it is having like more the computations uh, in terms of having the second ray and also the, uh, the shadow ray uh, for some more kind of the precise the computation. Uh, which is involving much more the competition and also the competition becomes like much more the expensive. So that's the basic idea and also the comparison based on the restoration and also the ray tracing. Any questions on this? So how long does it some, uh, take some time? So if we actually see, uh, go back to this kind of the uh, very basic kind of the uh, rendered image, uh, so this is basically the image which was first introduced in the 1979, uh, some you know, years ago. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this was kind of the first kind of the rendered image which could be able to basically uh, handle this kind of the transparent object. So with the restoration the pipeline, uh, it is impossible to have this kind of the uh, some sort of transparent object because we don't know how we can deal with these kind of things uh, in the restoration the, the pipeline. Uh, but in the ray tracing, the pipeline, we can basically shoot the ray, uh, not, not only basically you know, having the reflection over the surface, but making the ray to be uh, to pass through inside the object and having some more the precise the simulation. So now we can start to render this kind of the uh, sort of the transparent object in the scene. So this was kind of the first uh, image, which was basically rendering some kind of the transparent object uh, using the ray tracing the system. And at that time, when this image was introduced, uh, it was taking 74 minutes uh, to render this simple image, uh, which is taking lots of the time. Uh, but after like some you know, decades later, uh, using some kind of the better the, the computer, now we can you know, you know, render those kind of things in the six seconds. And if we use the GPU, now actually it takes like you know, real time, basically taking like one thirtieth of the, the seconds. But how about like if we have some more the complicated kind of things? So in the sort of the history of the computer the animation, uh, one of the kind of the famous example, like which is fully utilizing this kind of the ray tracing the system uh, is this an animation, the curse from the Pixar, uh, which was released in the 2006. 
So actually some kind of a characteristic of like this animation was that uh, this was kind of the case that, you know, there are lots of some kind of these 3D objects that have this kind of specular the, the materials uh, over the kind of the, the surface. So basically all the curves are basically having the metals, uh, which means that all the surfaces are basically some specular the materials, uh, which means that we really need to uh, calculate this kind of the reflection of the, the, the rays of the surface, uh, which will involve lots of the computation. And this is also the animation that you can see tones of the curves in a scene. Uh, so actually, if you see how this animation was created, actually they were taking tons of time for the competition. So even for like rendering a single frame of the animation, they said that actually sometimes it took, like in average, it took 17 hours uh, using the machine at the time. And sometimes just like to render a single frame, they said that it took like a week. So which is kind of the output of the super heavy competition uh, for every single frame. So this was kind of the sort of the extreme the case of like you know, fully realizing all the ray tracing the system uh, to get some very you know uh, precise and realistic images uh, by simulating all this kind of the ray traversal. So, uh, any questions on this? So basically, in the programming the assignments, what you will need to do is basically implementing the very basic system, uh, which is re rendering the images using the ray tracing uh, the pipeline. And the first step uh, to basically implement this kind of like ray tracing the system uh, is basically to implement the ray surface in the intersection. Obviously, uh, this is the first step. So for each of the, the camera model uh, and to the image plane, sorry. So like the task zero in the, the program the assignment is to basically shoot a ray uh, from the camera to the first uh, to the image uh, for each of the pixel uh, in, in the image plane. And then you should be able to basically check uh, whether this ray is basically intersecting to the any of the 3D object in the scene, and what's the exact point that we are having the intersection. So we should be able to calculate these kind of things. Uh, this is actually a very essential task, not only for the ray tracing the system, for, but for the many other things. So this is also uh, required not only to check the intersection between the ray from the camera to the 3D objects, but also when you shoot the shadow ray uh, when you also shoot the ray from the object to the light source and check any kind of the, the occlusion, uh, you also need to have this kind of the process. And also many for, for many other some kind of the geometry the processing, uh, this kind of the some ray intersection the check uh, is kind of the very the essential in the page the task. So this is like very simple, but basically type, you know, probably very, you know, in a very slow the task. So for every single D ray and also every single D3 object, you should be able to uh, check this kind of intersection. So let's do some kind of the simple the calculation. So let's think about this case that we are having a ray, uh, which is starting from this point. So I will denote uh, the origin of the camera center as kind of the O tilde. And we are shooting the ray into the D direction, so which is the vector here. So now the ray equation can be defined like this, right? So for any kind of the time t, uh, which is like zero or the greater than zero, uh, we can basically specify the point over the ray, right? So we now define this kind of the ray equation. So it's kind of the simple example. Uh, let's think about the case that we are checking the intersection between the ray and the plane. So now the plane is defined with the any of the point uh, over the plane, uh, which is actually the tilde here, and also the normal direction uh, over the, the surface. Then here, the simple the question is that if we assume some kind of the infinite plane uh, with any of the point and the, the surface normal, then how can you calculate the intersection between the ray and the plane? So this is the first place. Uh, so please post your answer the, over the, the slide. So let's think about the case that we're having this ray equation and what's the plane equation. Then how can I calculate the intersection between these two?
So just to clarify like what I explained about the ray tracing. Uh, so the thing is that like if we shoot a ray uh, from the camera uh, through the image plane and, and see some kind of the intersection with some 3D objects. Uh, so yeah, I mean, then you no, know, based on this intersection, the point, uh, we will determine the color information at this pixel, right? But what we do is that we do care about basically uh, the lighting. So how much the light uh, basically affects the color at this point. So we're gonna discuss this kind of the, the reflection, the modeling in terms of like how we determine the color at this point uh, based on the, the material information and also the light information. Uh, which means that we need to check whether this point is visible from the light source or not, right? So if we have this like the ray and the intersection, the point, and then we shoot a ray from this point to the light source in terms of to check like whether this point is also visible from the light source or not. And this ray that we are shooting from the intersection point to the light source is called the shadow ray. So if this was the ray, which was basically the ray from the camera to the object, and this is the ray from the object to the light source. Uh, this is to basically check whether this kind of the, uh, the light source is basically visible from, uh, you know, from this point or not. So if this light source is visible from this point, then now we can basically determine the color information uh, based on this material and the light source. Or if this point is not visible from the, this light source, then this is not the light, which is basically determining the color information at this point. Uh, so this point should be dark. We, this is the only light source. Uh, but there can be actually the multiple the light sources as well, which means that we also need to shoot the, uh, the shadow ray the multiple times. And if we also stop like shooting the ray at this point, and that's it, and this is the case that we are having the ray casting. But if we also recursively like you know, shoot the ray based on the reflection at this point, so if we have the plane, like you know, that's what we also learned in high school, like you know, if we have the uh, incoming ray at this point with incident the angle here, then when this is the normal direction, then we can also see that the, the ray is basically you know, uh, reflected with the same amount of the angle here, right? So based on that, we can also define some this kind of the, uh, some reflection of the ray at this point, and we can recursively repeat this process, like shooting the ray again, find the another intersection the point, and shooting the shadow ray again. So if we have this kind of the recursive the system, uh, this is the case that we are having the ray tracing. Uh, so this is kind of the terminology that we are using in the graphics. So just keep this in mind. Yeah, so this is basically what we are doing. Uh, so for that, we need to be able to basically calculate the intersection point. And obviously if we have the calculate intersection point of these two, uh, then we can uh, basically calculate the time t like this. So if this time t is negative, which means that the plane is only the behind of the ray, right? So there is no intersection point. So we are having the intersection point when only the t is basically uh, zero or the greater than zero. So this is basically the case that we are having the intersection. So this is clear, right? And also this kind of the ray and the plane intersection becomes like much simpler uh, if we have the axis align the plane. So we're gonna also see this kind of cases that we are having the axis aligned the plane. Uh, but if we have this kind of like axis aligned the plane, then you know, for example, like when you have the plane, uh, which is parallel to the YZ plane, uh, having this kind of the plane, then you know, the intersection becomes, uh, can be calculated into this simple form. So these are also kind of the obvious simple the calculation. Uh, the question is like, do we recursively create both a reflection ray and a reflection ray for each intersection point? Uh, yes, actually it depends on the property of the material. So we're gonna also discuss that point. So here the question is that whether we really uh, create both the reflection and the reflection of the ray. So it depends on how we define the material the property. Uh, so we're gonna get into this uh, in the rest of the lectures. Uh, any questions for the ray tracing, ray testing, shadow ray, second ray? So what we mean with the second ray is basically when you shoot the second ray uh, from the person uh, in the ray tracing system, that's the case that we're having the second ray. Cool. Yeah, so this was the case that we are calculating the intersection between the ray and the plane. But actually what we also have seen in the previous lecture is that we typically represent a 3D object 
as kind of the set of the triangles, right? So the typical the case that we are having the lots of the triangles in the 3D space, which means that we should be able to calculate the intersection uh, not only with the some infinite uh, the plane, but with this kind of the finite the, tri the triangle over the, the plane. So here the question is that how we can really check uh, you know, whether the ray is really intersecting with the triangle, which means that uh, when you find the intersection the point with the ray and the plane, uh, we should be able to also the check whether that point is included uh, in the plane in, in the triangle or not. So this is kind of the another the calculation that we need to do. So the kind of the simplest way that we can really check the intersection with the triangle, not with the plane, uh, is to leverage the barycentric the coordinates. So we briefly discussed the barycentric the coordinates in the second lecture, but let me briefly uh, review this idea. So in the so let's first see the line interpolation. So when you have the two point P one and the P two, uh, what we can see is that any point over this line seg the line segment connecting these two points. So given any two points and the P one and the P two, any point over this line segment uh, connecting these two points can be actually represented as kind of the linear interpolation uh, between these two points, right? So when you know, the ratio of like in the D segment and the D segment is then the T and the one minus T, then this point uh, interpolating these two points can be calculated like this, right? So this is the case that we're having the some linear interpolation. So the very the basic idea for the barycentric interpolation is to basically having this kind of interpolation not only for the line but also for the triangle as well. So let's think about the case and now we are having the three points and defining a triangle. We're having the P1 and the P2 and the P3. Then any point P tilde over this the triangle can also be represented as kind of some linear interpolation. Uh, having the like three D parameters, three D coefficients. Uh, let's say this is kind of, I don't know, like A and also the U and the V. And what we can see uh, here is that uh, as we can also see in the previous the line interpolation the case, so let me quickly go over this. So here, basically, uh, when you take some kind of the interpolation between the two points, the sum of the coefficients should be one, right? So as you can see, when you have the two the coefficients for the P1 and the P2, the sum of the coefficients should be one. So that's kind of the constraint uh, to have some kind of the interpolation. And also the thing is that each of the coefficients should be also greater than zero, right? Or same or the greater than zero. Uh, so that's the case that we're having the interpolation. Otherwise, if we also allow the negative the coefficients, then what's the such kind of the case? If we start to allow some kind of the negative uh, coefficients, then what's the case? I mean, if we if start to allow the negative coefficients, that's the case that we are starting to see some kind of the extrapolation, right? Very interesting. I mean, which means that now we are having not only points inside this line segment and also having the points outside of this line segment, but also still on the uh, straight line. And also this kind of the case where the sum of the coefficients are basically the one, and also each of the coefficients is basically non-negative the number. So those are the cases that we are having the convex uh, the you know, interpolation. So when you have the convex interpolation for the these two cases, uh, where we are basically drawing some kind of the line, which is connecting these two points. So which is kind of similar in the triangle case as well. So when you have the sorry, uh, three points, Having the three coefficients uh, for each of the point, uh, if the sum of the coefficients is one and also each of the coefficients is non negative the value, uh, for those cases, uh, basically having the convex interpolation, if we have the convex interpolation, then we are basically defining a triangle, uh, which is connect, you know, uh, connecting this kind of three D vertices. Is this clear? And also, I recommend you, you to check this out. But the thing is that uh, this kind of the weight, uh, the coefficients for each of the point, can be actually determined based on the area. 
This is also what we discussed last time. For example, like the coefficients for the second point P2 here uh, can be defined as kind of the ratio of the triangle, the area, this me using the P1, P2, P3, and then P tilde, P1 and P3. So the area of this part, which is the opposite of this point, over the entire the triangle. So this ratio basically becomes the uh, the coefficients at this point. So I recommend you to check this out, how we can really prove this. So those are kind of the way that we can uh, define some kind of the interpolation over the triangle. So here basically the thing is that uh, any kind of the point uh, over the, the triangle uh, defined with the three the vertices are basically uh, defined based on the three coefficients the coefficient for each of the, the purposes. And these three, the coefficients are called the barycentric uh, the coordinate. So what this means is that for any point over the 3D the space, if that point is included uh, in the triangle defined with the three purposes, uh, we can either represent the point with the x, y, z coordinates or we can represent the same point uh, based on the three the coefficients uh, defined for each of the P1, P2, P3, uh, the three vertices. So that's the another way that we can basically uh, express the position of the, the, the point, uh, especially when the point is located uh, inside the triangle. Uh, is this clear? And from the constraint that we know that you know, the sum of these three coefficients should be uh, one actually we can drop one of the oh, sorry uh, one of the coefficients here and having the only the two uh, the parameters sorry. yeah so instead of like having the three d parameters we can make this to be one minus u minus v uh, and just having the two parameters uh, which means that now we can even express any of the point not with the three d numbers but with the two numbers u and the v here Make sense? It is clear. Then what we can do is that we can just like plug in this kind of the uh, very centric the, the equation of each of the point uh, into the, our the ray equation. Then we can see uh, you know, these two should be the same. So the left hand side is basically the equation for the ray and the right hand side is basically the equation based on the very centric coordinates. So based on this kind of the constraint that these two should be exactly the same, uh, we can just solve this kind of the linear equation uh, with the three parameters here. So if we basically you know, solve this kind of the linear the, the system, we can determine the t, uh, which will also determine the position uh, of the, over the ray. Uh, it is clear. Here, one quick question is that what will be the case that this matrix is not immutable, so we cannot have the any kind of solution. We can so what is with the case that we cannot have the, some unique solution. So what is this kind of the case that is matrix, this matrix is not immutable, so we cannot uh, specify the unique solution. I mean, there are multiple such kind of cases, uh, but, but that can, one case might be is that the triangle has the zero area, uh, that's kind of the exception of the case, but if we do not such kind of the, some extreme cases, 
uh, that we have some kind of the non-zero area, the kind of triangle, then as you can see, like these are kind of the two vectors uh, which are spanning the uh, subspace, uh, defining the plane that includes this kind of the, you know, triangle. And it was, if this matrix is not invertible, which means that uh, this direction of the ray is basically uh, dependent uh, to the you know, uh, subspace of the two, two vectors, which means that uh, this direction of the ray is basically the parallel uh, to the kind of the image plane, the, the triangle, sorry, here. So when the ray is basically the parallel to the, the triangle, that plane, we cannot find the intersecting the point. So that will be one of the, the cases that we cannot determine the unique dissolution. There is no solution for that case, right? So for those kind of cases, you know, this matrix will not be uh, invertible and we cannot solve this linear system. And also based on the output of the T and the U and the V, uh, you know, if we uh, find this intersecting point, then all these kind of constraints should be satisfied, which means that T should be non-negativity number and also the U and the V should be uh, the number inside the zero and the one range, right? And also the U plus V should be uh, in this range. So when we satisfy uh, the kind of the outputs that, you know, uh, satisfy all these kinds of the constraints, then we can see that those are the cases that the, uh, we are finding some kind of intersection between the ray and the triangle. Some simple decalculation. So let's do more one more kind of the, some simple decalculation. So by the way, those are kind of sort of things that you will need to implement if you're deploying your assignment. Uh, another some kind of the simple the uh, calculation is that uh, if we have the ray and also the sphere as well, like sphere is some kind of the primitives. So the case is you know when we wanna see some kind of the sphere as kind of the, our the primitives is that sometimes we also represent some kind of the 3D objects as kind of a set of the points. So we call those kind of things as kind of the point cloud. So when you have the point cloud, sometimes we might also want to assign some kind of the volume uh, for each of the points. Uh, that might be the case that we are representing each of the point as kind of this pier, as you can see here, or actually those points can be represented as the disk or the ellipsoid, all the things. Actually, the case that I you know, mentioned at the very beginning of the lecture, having the out and split, uh, those are actually the cases that we are representing each of the point as kind of the ellipsoid, uh, which is slightly more complicated than this. But let's think about the like simple case, that like we are having some kind of the, a set of the points, and but actually these of the points are not just like point, but having some volume, so which can be represented as a sphere. So if we have the ray and the sphere, then also how can you find the first intersection the point? Uh, let's also work on this question. Yeah, key. So did you get this kind of like quadratic formulation? So you will see that actually we are getting this kind of the quadratic the formula. So if we solve the quadratic formula, then there might be three cases. So if there is no solution, which means that there is no intersection between the ray and the sphere, 
and if we also have the the uh, root uh, the, the solution having the single dissolution, the there might be the case that the ray is basically having the intersection the point at the single point like this. Or typically we're gonna see this kind of the cases uh, where the ray is basically intersecting at the two points over the sphere. So uh, we can pick the point, uh, one of the, the two solutions, which is like having the similarity, uh, but still the non-negativity. Uh, so there might be kind of the uh, the first intersection point between the ray and the sphere. Right? So for any kind of the primitives, we can consider basically solving all those kind of things and then finding the intersecting point. So you know, also for the fast computation, it might be the matter of like how we can efficiently compute all the kind of things. Uh, one more case might be is that now we can also consider like representing all these 3D objects and the scenes not as some kind of some explicit the objects, but as kind of be some implicit the surface. So we can also get into the idea of like having the implicit surface later, especially for these neural rendering things. Uh, but those are some of the cases that we are now representing all these kind of the 3D objects in the scene, uh, not as some kind of the mesh or the point cloud, but actually as a the function. You see, there are also the multiple the ways that we're having some implicit representation. Uh, but for example, uh, we can represent this kind of sphere as kind of like this kind of some implicit function. So if we say that like when you calculate this, uh, if this number is basically greater than one, which means that that point is outside of sphere, right? And if that point is like less than one, that means that the point is inside of this the, the sphere. And only when these two are basically the same, you can see that that point is exactly over this the surface. So like having this kind of the formulation uh, for each of the objects can be one of the way that we can represent uh, a, some of the three objects in a kind of the indirect way using some kind of the formulation. Uh, this is kind of the implicit representation and we also call uh, implicit surfaces. So when you also have this kind of like implicit surfaces, how we can basically find the intersection point between the ray and this kind of the objects? Well, the simplest way is that we are basically Marching the ray, so from the starting point, like along the this direction, like we are basically making some kind of steps, and every step we can check whether the point is exactly over the surface or not, and if the point is basically having the uh, the positive the the kind of value with the function, which means that the point is outside of the objects, then we can go one step further, right, uh, and we can basically create this kind of process uh, until we have that this value becomes zero. So this is kind of the simple idea in terms of like how we can uh, find the intersection point between the ray and the implicit surfaces. But actually, there can be some more efficient way, especially when you have this kind of some uh, some signed distance uh, representation. So here, basically, signed distance means that we are having some kind of the function uh, which is taking any kind of point over the surface over the space. In terms of that. Uh, this function is now representing if this value is basically positive, uh, which means that the point is outside. Uh, negative means that the point is inside. And if the point is zero, uh, then that means that uh, the point is exactly over the surface, right? So this is kind of the sine distance function representation for the three objects. And if we have this kind of the sine distance function, uh, how can it, what kind of the efficient way that we are doing some kind of the marching the ray over this space? Any ideas? Yeah, so let me just move on this. So uh, the simplest kind of the way is to, is to do this kind of like sphere tracing. So here the basic idea is that, let's say we start from here. And let's say we fetch the kind of the signed distance value. And if this distance is basically negative or equal to zero, then we can stop marching the ray. But if this value is greater than zero, which means that, so let's see, if this is like greater than zero, actually this means that the closest point uh, from this point, to the any of the point over this, this surface might be this. So when you basically measure the distance uh, from this quarry point to the any of the closest point over the surface, 
that becomes our design distance, right? This basically means that it's now safe to merge the array with amount of like this distance because like until this distance in this pair, there should be no obstacles uh, in this 3D scene. If there are some kind of any objects here, which means that the sign distance should be shorter than this. That's it makes sense. It's basically a very simple idea. So every point, uh, we are basically calculating the signed distance. Uh, if this distance is zero or the negative, then we stop the merging, right? But if this distance it is the positive, let's say having some kind of the distance b, then which means that uh, in this pair defined with the radius of the d, there should be no any kind of the some obstacles. Because if there are some obstacles, then this distance should be uh, smaller than d, right? So it's safe to march the array until like the end of like this pair, the bound of this pair. So we go this step, and then we calculate the sign distance again. Then there was a define this pair, and we iterate this kind of marching. So this can be slightly more the efficient way in terms like you no, know, we are seeing how much we can basically proceed uh, this kind of marching uh, based on the sign this distance we are getting for every single day point. That makes sense. So this is the basic idea, which is called this peer tracing. And can you guess some kind of the some extreme cases that this kind of the process becomes like very inefficient? Any thoughts? This is already showing some kind of the extreme the cases, but for example, like we are shooting the ray in this direction, and the some objects are basically having this kind of the shape. Then what we can see is that this ray should have the intersection uh, at here, right? But actually, you no. Know, on the way to going to this intersection the point, we are basically approaching. Uh, to this region, uh, which basically making the sign distance to be very small. So at the very beginning, the sphere will be big like this, right? But as you go further, we're gonna have a very tiny sphere, uh, which means that as you get closer to the any kind of the, the some kind of surface of the objects, uh, the kind of the interval of the, the marching becomes also the smaller. So gee, we get very small, you know, uh, slower uh, here, and then we get some kind of the bigger the sphere like this. So depending on you know, what sort of the objects and also the ray direction that you have, actually this spear tracing can even become uh, you know, you know, less efficient than some kind of the other the ideas. So there can be some kind of pros and cons, so like having this kind of the approaches. Any questions on this? Yeah, so these are all the examples that we are checking the intersection between the ray and the some of the objects in the scene that are defined as kind of the plane, triangle, sphere, or implicit representations. But here also the question is that how can you also accelerate this kind of the, the computation for the intersection? So because like what we really need to end up doing in the ray tracing the system would be is that for every single the pixel, and also every single of the objects for all these kind of the combinations, uh, we will need to basically check this kind of the intersection. Uh, so depending on the number of the rays, basically number of the pixels and the number of the objects in the scene, uh, this computation will be extremely heavy. Uh, like one some kind of example is that uh, this is a kind of scene uh, which is basically uh, rendered using some kind of the ray tracing the system. And can you guess how many triangles we have do we have in this thing to represent all the details in the leads, like all these kind of things. I don't know, also for some kind of defined details over the, the back part of the chair. How many triangles do we need? Can you guess? Any any guess? How many triangles we have? Yeah, one million, two million, ten million, five hundred k. 
Uh, actually, this is the case that we are having the 10 millions, 10.7 billions of the triangles. Uh, so which means that we have some hundreds of thousands of the, the pixels and having the 10 million the triangles. Uh, we need to calculate all the intersections for the, all the combinations like these two, which will be extremely heavy. Right? Uh, this is another even more extreme the case. We are having the 20 million the triangles. Like having this kind of like millions of triangles is quite common in many kind of the some graphics, some kind of the uh, the outputs. So here the question is that how can we efficiently basically compute all these kinds of the intersection in a way that uh, we can boost up the ray tracing the system? So the basic idea for those kind of the, the acceleration in the computation uh, is to have some kind of the bounding the volumes. So the basic idea for the bounding volume is that uh, we are encapsulating some of the three D objects uh, into we, using some kind of the primitives that we know it becomes like much simpler to calculate this kind of the uh, the intersection. So, for example, like when you have this kind of like some complicated shape, we are basically you know uh, you know encapsulating this kind of the objects into the simple the bounding box uh, in a way that the computation of the intersection becomes we we the ray and the bounding box becomes like much simpler. Uh, compared to like computing the intersection with the ray and the some real these three objects. So what kind of the primitives can you use? We can also use the sphere because we also already know how to compute the intersection with the sphere and boxes, whatever, anything that we want to do. Uh, one of the kind of the ideas is using the axis aligned uh, the bounded boxes. So if we use the axis aligned, aligned the bounded boxes, then what we need to do is that we can see that actually all the boxes can be represented as kind of the three pairs of these, these slabs. So for each of the X, Y, Z axis, we are having the two parallel planes. Uh, so in the 2D case, for example, here, uh, we are having the uh, this pair and another pair, right? And in the 3D case, we're gonna have the three pairs of these slabs. And we have seen in the previous slide that you know, you know, com computing the intersection with the axis along the planes uh, it's really simple, right? So this becomes really the simple calculation. So given this kind of the intersection with the uh, three pairs of these slabs, uh, which is basically giving the kind of the minimum and the maximum the values of the time uh, for each of the ray, uh, we can find, we can check uh, whether the ray is basically intersecting uh, with the bounded box or not. So what this basically shows is that for each of the axes, uh, so this is the case that for this axis, we are having this slab and this slab, uh, given these two slabs, we can basically see the intersection point, two intersection points, uh, which are represented as the T min and the T max. And we can compute this kind of the range of the time uh, for each of the axes, right? So for each of the axis, axis we're going to have the T min and the T max. For the X and the Y, we're going to have the, this range, and also G, we're going to also have the, this range, right? And given this kind of the three D ranges of the times, can, how can you check whether the ray is intersecting with the box or not? Uh, another question. Yeah, basically, if the maximum of the all the t mean values for each of the uh, you know, x and the y and the z uh, is basically sorry, t mean y, t mean z becomes basically uh, smaller than the minimum of the t max uh, for each of the axis, uh, that will be the case that we are having some kind of intersection between the ray and the bounded boxes. So, yeah, we are running out of time, but I recommend you to check out how we can uh, find the, the check the intersection between the ray and this kind of the axis aligned uh, the bounded boxes uh, based on this kind of the three ranges uh, defined with the uh, three the slabs uh, for each of the axis. So yeah, so this is kind of good. So then you know, now we can see, you know, we can basically somehow you know, represent some kind of the groups of the objects using the bounded boxes. And here, so the question is that, how should we basically define the bounded boxes? So when you have this kind of the scene, should we basically make like one big 
giant debounded box that includes everything? Or should we basically uh, make debounded boxes for each of the objects, right? What would be kind of the best way? So the problem is that if we have like the one big bounded box, so it can be good to for some of the cases that like when the ray does not hit any of the objects. So if the ray does not hit any of the objects like this, then we can just quickly check the intersection between the ray and the bounded box. And if we see that the ray is not hitting the box, then we can ignore all the objects in the scene. That's good. But the problem is that if the ray starts to hit uh, the, the bounded box, which means that now we need to check the intersection with all the, uh, the, the, the primitives uh, included in the bounded box, then you know, it's not efficient at all, right? Also, the other cases around is that if we have the bounded box for each of the objects, then if we have the n number of the objects, then we are also having the n number of the bounded boxes. Then there is no acceleration, right? So here the basic idea is that, uh, so let's think about the case that we are doing some kind of the binary search in the 1D. So if we have this kind of the sequence of the integer number and given any kind of the query number, let's say, I don't know, like uh, nine or I don't know, uh, when the k is, for example, like 11 or something, then what's the kind of the best way that we can find some kind of the uh, the number in the sequence, which is closest uh, to the given the query number? Then what we learned in the algorithm course might be is that we are doing some kind of the binary search, right? So even this claim the sorted uh, the sequence of the number, uh, we take the median here and check whether our the, the query number 11 is basically smaller and the greater uh, than this kind of the some pivot number. Then we can basically take out all these kind of the parts on the left hand side. We only care about this, right? And then we pick the median at this subset again and comparing with the query number, just repeating these kind of things. So in this way, we can make some kind of the uh, the complexity, the time complexity of the search to be basically log n, right? So here the question is that how can we do the kind of same things in the three D space as well? So as we basically define this kind of the binary the search tree, uh, we can consider making some kind of the hierarchical tree in the three D space. Uh, in terms of that, we can basically uh, accelerate this kind of the search process. So that's the basic idea of the bounding volume the hierarchy. So here the, the basic idea is that uh, we are starting from this kind of the big bounding box, and then basically splitting this kind of the, the biggest set into the two disjoint set. So here the thing is that we are making the two disjoint sets of the, the primitives, basically dividing the, the set of the primitives into the two subsets. But still, when you see some kind of the bounding box, those of the two the, the two subsets, uh, those bounded boxes can overlap in the space. So what you can see is that this is the case that we are splitting the primitives, not the space. We're gonna also see the other way around. So as you can see, uh, start from the biggest set of the primitives, uh, we split the set of the primitives and making the two bounded boxes, and we can iterate this kind of process uh, in terms of like making some kind of tree. The basic idea for that is that for each of the the uh, the step of like splitting, uh, we are choosing the axis, axis align the axis, and then we are having some kind of the candidate uh, the split, uh, which is defined as this kind of the uh, half plane the space. So we can basically uh, define this kind of the candidate the split the planes, uh, basically some kind of uniform sampling where you know adaptable sampling those kind of things uh, by the end point of the primitives. And then given this kind of the candidate planes for the split, uh, we are choosing the best one, one of the best one. And then we repeat this kind of process for each of the axes, having some kind of the candidate planes for the split and choose one of the best. And then here the question is that, uh, what's the kind of the best split in this kind of case? Uh, let me give you some kind of example. So we have this kind of the scene. And then we are basically having some kind of the multiple the candidates of the split the planes. For example, here. Then, how are you going to basically uh, choose these split planes? Uh, can you divide uh, the this set of the planes? Any ideas? Yeah, let's make this as kind of the last quiz.
what would be kind of the best way to basically divide this set of primitives into the two subgroups and why? So since we are running out of time, so let me go a bit quickly. But so actually the reason that I'm asking this is that if we follow the binary search, that what we will need to do is that uh, we're gonna basically pick the median, right? So we are having like sorted the primitives here from the left to right. So we are having the like one, two, three, three. Um, so in the given the order of the sorting, like one, Two, three, four, like I don't know, five, six, seven, eight. So since we are having the eight different tips, uh, if we basically divide uh this into the two sets, then the kind of the if we follow the binary search, then the kind of the two sets might be like this and this. Right? I mean, if we just like simply just follow the binary search. Uh, so this is like basically what we're gonna see uh, when you just like divide this into the two subsets that are basically e having the equal number of the primitives, then we're gonna get this. But we can actually see that this is quite inefficient. Why? Uh, because we are having this kind of the big bounding box. So actually, it's better to have some kind of the tight bounding box in a way that uh, so for all the rays that are passing through the empty space, uh, we should not basically check the intersection uh, with the any of the uh, some of the primitives, right? So basically, when you have some kind of this sort of the tight, the bounding boxes, uh, we can reduce this kind of the, uh, some sort of the, you know, first part of the cases where basically the ray is basically intersecting with the bounding box while the ray is actually not intersecting with the, any of the primitives. So the, here, the key is basically how we can minimize uh, this kind of the, some of the volumes of the, of the bounding boxes uh, in a way that we can have some more the efficient system. So for that, basically, we can think about how we're gonna basically, uh, you know, define some kind of the most efficient case, like dividing the the, the bounded boxes. So we can define this kind of the traverse of the cost. Uh, so here, basically, this is kind of the constant term, basically checking whether you know uh, the some kind of the cost of the travel flow uh, with some kind of the interior denote. So basically, some bounding box the test, and then we're gonna also some kind of the cost uh, for the left sub three and also the cost of the right of tree uh, with some kind of the probability, uh, whether the ray is really intersecting with the left set, the bounding box, and also the right set, the bounding box. And there are some kind of ways that we can approximate uh, for each of the term here. Uh, so since we are running out of time, I'm going to resume those things uh, in the on Wednesday. Uh, but I'd like to recommend you to check this out. Basically, what's the kind of the best way that we are defining uh, this kind of some hierarchical tree with the bounding boxes in a way that we can make some more uh, efficient system that can really accelerate this kind of the uh, computation of the intersection. So let me stop here, and I will basically resume this part uh, in the on Wednesday. Uh, any questions on this? So especially the things that we discussed today, the ray and the primitive intersection, uh, those are basically things that you will need to implement your the program media assignment. So I recommend you to check out the program media assignment as always as possible and see what the kind of things that you need to implement there. And if you have also have any questions for the program media assignment, uh, please let us know in the Skype. Okay. And I will see you on next Wednesday. Okay. Thank you.